tell you what, if we ever really got grips on him, he's alive. Amen? Uh, we'd probably do some things we've never done before in our life. Amen? If we just ever come to the real realization uh, that we serve a risen Savior. Amen? He's alive and well on the throne of God today. It was his blood that purchased our sin. Amen? And I thank God for listening. Nothing else in this world could pay the price outside of the blood of Jesus Christ. And I appreciate what he did for us. Thank God for the song this morning. Let me mention a couple of prayer requests this morning. I want to do like we've been doing and uh, come and get around the altar uh, and pray. And I pray that you'll be serious about your prayer life and uh, what God wants to do at the church. If you want, some of you want to hang out around the altar, you can. But let me just mention a couple of things. Uh, if I can this morning, don't forget to pray for our business meeting uh, this afternoon here at the church and uh, then pray for others that are going through some trying times that God knows all about uh, in several things. Several folks we met there at the hospital uh, that's going through some trying times, please pray for them. There's a young girl there uh, that I met her parents the other day. She just uh, went through a brain tumor operation. She's 13 years old and her name is Kaylin. If you would pray for her. Uh, today, pray for Brother Todd Walker's brother, Henry. I've been visiting with him. Pray and hold him up uh, to the Lord. Preacher Lowry, Miss Lowry's son-in-law, Dale Fortner. We were over there again Friday. Dale's got a long way to go uh, in this rehab. But I think there's a God up in heaven big enough, amen, to help him through and get him through. So pray for them. They've spent a lot of long hours over there. And uh, pray for Wendy, for, uh, for the kids and those that travel back and forth. And then pray for our churches around and uh, pray for all these things that are going on in America that we don't understand. Brother Cliff hit the nail on the head this morning. Uh, in the opening service this morning, we thank the Lord uh, for that and what God can do. Amen. And so let's pray for all these situations we've been talking about here in the church and all that can and will this morning. Let's come get around the altar and let's pray. Beg God's presence in this place today. Beg God to help and heal and to touch and lift up just in a mighty way. In this church around America and all across the world, touch those in and out of the hospitals, going through trials, tribulations, whatever they are. Father, God, again, we want to say we love you today. And God, we are thankful, we are honored, and God, we are privileged to call you our God today. God, we believe with all our heart that you are alive and well there in the portals of glory. God, to me today, and I pray to the people in this church today, you're just not some religious event going on. You are a holy God. And God, we adore you today. We worship you today. And we thank you today, God, for even spending time with us, for reckoning with us, God, for coming down and meeting with us, and God, sending the good Holy Spirit of God by our way to touch the services and Father, I pray today, God, it'd be no different in this place that you'd rain down upon us today, the good Holy Spirit of God. Give us unction to preach with power today. God, thank you for the choir. And God, all the great music that has come from that. Bless every song after that that's sung. God, bless the words that may proceed out of my mouth today. God, let me preach every word in this place that should be preached today, and not one that shouldn't be. Father, I pray, God, you'd have your will and your way and your work done. God, inside these doors today, touch the altar today and all these prayer requests that are going up around the altar. God, give them strength today. Heal the sick. Reach out in the hospitals and the homes and touch those that are going through tragedies and those that are going through trials. And Father, those that are just sick and those that are downtrodden today. And God, touch the lost today and those that do not believe today. And God, may we find a way through the good word of God and the Holy Spirit to find a way to reach them with the gospel. As we said in our Sunday school class this morning, we must be moving and we must be moving forward. And we must be moving forward by faith. And God, I pray that through that, Lord, we'd go and preach to others and reach the whole world and teach them, Lord, to observe whatsoever thing. God, you've commanded of us, God, that they'll do the same thing. Bless churches and pastors all across the world today. God, give pastors strength this morning. Give them boldness in the word of God. Lord, meet their every need. God, give them wisdom. And God, give them the strength that they'll need physically to stand and preach.
God, with the power of God upon their life this morning. And Father, there's one to come through the doors of the church house, this church, and others of like faith, God. If there's one to come through the door that's lost and undone, God, this would be the day that something would be said or sung or done or preached, God, today. They'd come to know you before it's eternally too late. Don't let us leave out the same way we came in. God, change our hearts. Change our minds today. God, change our thinking today. Change our families and change our conditions today. God, let us go out and rejoice and say it's been good to be in the house of God. Let us worship you today and magnify you today. God, from within. And Father, we pray for the revival that's coming up. And God, Brother Cliff's already said it's not about a tent. And revival don't start under the tent. Revival starts in the heart of men and women. I had boys and girls, and I pray, Father, today, God, that you'd start a fire. God, down in us, Lord, that people would magnify you and they'd see the glory of God. Lord, magnify through this place and through our people. And through that, Father, they'd seek you and seek wisdom in you. Help us, Lord, to be all that we can be for you. God, we love you today. I'm thankful to be your servant today. I'm thankful to be able to serve you, Lord, in whatever capacity. God, you allow us to. God, whether it's behind the pulpit, or God, whether it's out being a servant in the community, whether it's on an altar praying, God, whether it's giving out something, regardless of what it is, Lord, we're thankful today to be your servant. And God, we just pray that thy will would be done. Father, in this place, Lord, now in this hour, and Lord, you'd get all the glory. We'll thank you and love you for what you've done. And God, what you will do, we praise you for it. We ask all these things in Christ's wonderful name. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Michael, come lead us in a song today. Let's stand for page 368. Nothing but the blood. 
uh, so you'll know what's going on. I'm going to mention only a couple things. There's a lot of things coming up down the road, but for sake of time, I don't want to get involved in all that, but there's a lot of work days coming up down, uh, down the road for the church uh, with the tent meeting. Thank you to the men that came and helped yesterday. Uh, the guys, uh, Brother Cliff, Brother Josh, they got the lights up out here yesterday around back where it's been pretty dark. You come around there at night now, you're going to be able to see. They got some things there. We got some wood cut yesterday uh, for some families, so thank you to the Lord for the men that came and helped there. And so you pray and continue to come whenever you can uh, to help us out. We would appreciate that, okay? And then today at 4 o'clock, uh, we have our business meeting. We have a big yearly business meeting. Always uh, we try to have it the last Sunday of January, first Sunday of February every year. And tonight will be that financial meeting. There will also be a budget proposal presented there for the church for this year. Uh, and what we have spent this past year, what we will spend or plan to spend this coming year, and where all of our monies have gone to, some things we're looking at doing this year. And so if you would like to be a part of that, that is 4 o'clock this afternoon for the members of New Life Baptist Church. I will reiterate this again. If you've been coming to this church for some time, you're not a member, and you're, you're seeking membership and want to be a part of this uh, ministry, you say, Preacher, I'd like to be there uh, to see how everything operates at the church. You're welcome to come. That's not a problem. You can't vote on anything, but you're welcome to come and be a part uh, of that meeting. As I said many times, there's no skeletons in the closet around here. Amen. Finances is finances. And if you do it right, there's no problems. Amen. And God's been good to us. So if you want to come this afternoon and be a part of that for your church, uh, then you come and be a part of that. We're also going to be starting prayer meetings every, five, every Sunday afternoon at 5 o'clock here uh, at the church. We're going to try to go out here and pray on the grounds where the tent is going to be. Or if it's raining or wet, we'll pray in here. Uh, but uh, down the road, man, and I'm going to mention this, get you a, we're going to start this, this, this coming Tuesday. This is for the men, okay? Men's prayer meeting every Tuesday afternoon at 530 for the men that can make it. Here's what we're going to do. So come prepared. Rain, snow, or shine, we're going to pray where the tent's going to be. Amen? We want to see God do a great work out there. How many of y'all remember the message I preached been a year or so ago on chance of rain 100%? Amen. I noted that on the calendar of events. Amen. It could be a chance of rain of 100%, but at 5.30 on Tuesday afternoon, we're going to see how bad you want revival. Amen. Amen. Chance of rain may be 100%, but we're going to pray out here on the ground. So you can wear a raincoat, you can bring you an umbrella, or if you can get out there on a four-wheel drive, you can pull out there on your truck and pray in your truck if you want to. Just invite me with you. Amen. I'm just kidding about that, but listen, we're going to pray. And we want you to come and pray with us. We'll mention this over and over and over again. There's a lot of other things coming up that we'll mention this afternoon at the business meeting. Let me do say this. The ski trip is coming up uh, February the 16th for all those that want to go. Uh, this is for the youth. Uh, and if you're 16 years old and over, you can go. If you're under 16 years old, you must have a responsible guardian with you. Uh, to be able to go or well, make sure your parents make sure that no, somebody knows that, that somebody has to be that responsible for you. Go ahead. Yeah, I forgot to say that there. Yeah. Miss Christy, I said, a lot. If you're going to go on a skiing trip or the ski thing, uh, please pick up one of these things because there's a deadline for some money that has to be paid by February All right. 6th. And okay. All right, so there's a paper like this in the back also on that table. Get a calendar of events, get you one of these if you plan to go on the ski trip and uh, come and go with us. We're going. I'm planning to have a great time that day while we're there. And so we'd like, you, we'd like you to come and be with us, too, if you can go. And if you can't ski, you can sit in the lodge, drink coffee, and watch us. Amen. And fellowship, it'd be okay. And, but we're going to go out there and roll up and be a snowball for a little while. Amen. And so if you like to go with us, you can. We'll mention some of those other things tonight that are going on. There's a lot of things going on uh, down the road. Okay. Anything else that's emerged that I need to mention maybe this morning. Amen. It's good to have, so good to have Brother Mike and Miss Joan back with us. They've been gone all week on the trip. Had a blast. Yeah. And they're already talking about signing up for next year at the Singing at Sea Cruise. If you want to go, you better sign up early yeah. and uh, get, on, get on board. And uh, I know there's a lot of folks already planning to uh, go on that for next year. But, and I'd love to go, but just, it just we'll, we'll have to see. If Jane gives us permission, we'll go. How about that? Amen? But we'll, we'll see about that. Anything else today? All right, Michael, come on in. Uh, let's take an offering this morning. And why, I tell you what, why would, Megan, are you going to sing during our offering this morning? All right, Miss Megan is going to sing during our offering this morning. So come on up here, and let's get let's call the, get the ushers to come on up this morning. And um, while they are while they are ushering today and taking up the money, Megan is going to sing. 
And we figured out a way to, to make y'all give more. Some young pretty lady, young pretty lady up here singing, and y'all feel sorry and just give, just go to the depths of your wallet. Say, I'm just kidding about that. Y'all know that, amen. But come on up here, Megan. You gonna sing over there, show? Sure? All right, she's gonna come up here and sing. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and remember the offering. While while y'all are taking up the offering, Megan's gonna um, sing for us. Say, brother Josh, how about pray for us? Say, lead us in offering. Man, isn't that awesome? That takes a lot right there. Amen. Thank you, Megan. I appreciate that, sweetie. I'm going to tell you right now, that's awesome there. Thank the Lord for it. And boy, she stood up there like a king. Amen. Yes. Brother Tom, she's going to grow into a singer, buddy. I can tell you that now. Thank you, Megan. I appreciate that. All right, Jane, you and uh, Tapta and Miss, Miss, uh, you and Miss Nicole Tapta, and um, I think they're going to sing one uh, for us today just before I get started. Amen.
to call upon your name. All my life I've been a sinner, and for that I am ashamed. But I heard that you were listening, so I singing for the moment because I'm not going to lie lately I've felt pretty unworthy unworthy to pray because I've not been the greatest Christian maybe and every time I sing this song God reminds me that I'm, I'm okay and that I've asked him in my life and that I'm his child and that no matter what I do he's still there for me no matter how unworthy I feel, no matter how burdened I feel, I'm sure there's some sitting in here that feel pretty unworthy. Maybe you haven't had the greatest week. Maybe you haven't been the best example. Maybe you've done things that you're not proud of this week. But God wants you to know that he's there. You're never, you never mean nothing to him. You mean everything to him. And I, I get reminded just this morning in Sunday school, Paige was telling a story about a patient she's been dealing with and how in the world's eyes, we would consider him pretty much unworthy of God's love and unworthy for us to care for him. But she said it reminded her that what if God looked at us the same way? That if how we see people is how God sees us, that you're not worthy of my love. You're not worthy for me to take care of you. You're not worthy for me to pray for you. But I'm so glad that I serve a God who sees me as his child and who sees a different me. 
and can look through because when he looks at me, he looks through the blood. He doesn't see all the things. He doesn't see me like you see me and might say, Tabby's just, Tabby's not being nice today or whatever it may be. But I'm so glad that no matter how unworthy I feel, he's always there for me. If you feel unworthy today, please know that you're not. You mean something to God. If you need to come pray, come pray. There's people here to pray with you. We'll sing one more verse. Appreciate all the singing this morning. Appreciate what God's doing around here in His house today. And uh, appreciate the opportunity to come and preach this morning. And uh, boy, I just pray that God uses us uh, in a mighty way. And uh, pray God's will be done. And I pray that if you're in this place this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Master of your life, that something's already been said or something's been sung today. Uh, that you may get convicted before the day is over and come to know him. Uh, it's about seeing souls saved, amen? 
and uh, I appreciate what God is doing. Turn your Bibles this morning, uh, if you would, over the First Corinthians chapter 16, and uh, hold your place there for just a minute, and then go to Acts chapter 2. First Corinthians chapter 16, and then go to Acts chapter 2, and hold your place there for just a couple of minutes. I just want to share something with you. Uh, back weeks and weeks and weeks ago when uh, Brother D.R. had asked me to come and preach for the banquet uh, out in Greenville for the Voice of Hope ministry there, uh, I began to pray and beg God and ask God about what to uh, preach while we were out there. I knew we wouldn't have that long to preach, but I wanted to be able to say a, a lot of stuff in a short amount of time, and that's hard for me, and you all know that. It just gets better and better all the time. Uh, when we get into God's Word, and for a preacher, that's hard to do. And so I began to study and read, and God, I ran across something one day that God impressed upon my heart, two verses here in the Word of God uh, for that meeting, uh, for that night. And uh, I dealt with those two verses while I was out there, and uh, I wanted to bring that to the church and share this same thought with the church a uh, little different way. There's a lot more to the uh, to it than what I shared out there. I only had about 15 to 20 minutes out there, and here I got two and a half hours, amen, so I can share it all. So say amen right there, amen. That scares some of you to death. You know I'm not going to do that, but it'll scare you anyway, amen. But uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 8 and 9 is what God gave me when we went out there. And I want to share with you here what Paul is doing here uh, and the writing that he's saying, and then we're going to talk about Acts chapter 2 and deal with Pentecost for just a little bit. Some of you raised your hand, most of you raised your hand around here uh, last week when I said, how many of you are ready for revival? And you want to see the tent go up, and you want to see uh, revival in the land, and about 95% of you more raised your hand. There's some that raised your hand, some says, well, Brother Mike, I just don't raise my hand. Some didn't raise a hand because they're not ready for revival. And I'm going to be honest with you. Can I just be boldly and blatantly honest with you today as your pastor uh, from the pulpit? I'm not sure most of us are ready for revival. Amen? Uh, I'm not sure that we know sometimes what we're raising our hand for. We want to be able to follow the crowd, and we want to think that we are. Uh, but there's a great cost involved with revival. And there's a great cost involved with Paul saying here and what we're going to deal with uh, in Acts chapter 2. And there's a great cost involved for a Pentecost. And Paul says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 8 and 9, I want you to look at what he says. This verse stuck out to me and struck me when I was reading. Paul says, but I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. I'm going to stay here until Pentecost is what Paul is saying. He's writing here to the Corinthian church at this time, and he explains his desire to uh, be with them, but he realizes here, according to verse 9, Paul realizes that there is a great door that has been opened to where he is at there at Ephesus. He says in verse 9 here, for a great door and an effectual is open unto me. He said there is a very effective door or an opportunity to do an effective work here where I'm at. I would love to come to you. My desire is to come to you. My desire is to be what you are when he's writing to the Corinthian church here. But he said, hold on. God has opened up something for me right here where I'm at, and I'm going to stay here until Pentecost. I'm going to stay here until I see God's work finished or God's work done or see God what God births out of this here in the, uh, when it comes to Pentecost. Paul says, for there's a great and effectual is open unto me. And he also says this, there are many adversaries. There's many trials. There's many tribulations. There's much persecution. There's a lot of things that's coming my way is what he's saying, but... I'm going to remain here until Pentecost. I'm going to remain here until God does something great. I'm going to remain here until God births something out of this thing 
that we've got going on. Now, I took that to Greenville, Tennessee, and used it in the, in the incident with D.R. being there in Greenville where he remained there for 30 weeks in revival and stayed there until God birthed something there in Greenville, Tennessee. And he has birthed, birthed several ministries out of uh, the tent revival and out of the work that's going on. Matter of fact, this past week there alone uh, in the Assembly of God Church where they've been preaching, I think they've had 37 people saved uh, there this week, about 15 churches represented uh, there this week, God is still doing an amazing work. They, had, they have birthed a headquarters out there for Voice of Hope uh, Ministries. They're going to build a building on the property where they were at. That property has been donated uh, to, the, to the ministry there. A lot of things have been birthed out of uh, that work out there that God's doing. And I use that in that idea of what was going on uh, out there. But now we're back here at New Life Independent Baptist Church. And we're talking about starting a tent revival and starting a meeting out here that we've got geared up for two weeks. And what happens if it does go 30 weeks? What happens if it does go 50 weeks? What happens if it does go 60 weeks? What happens if God gets in the middle of it and says that we cannot shut it down until we birth something out of it? Something is going to come up out of it that's going to be great for God. Something can be birthed out of that. But you and I have to get in our mind, as Paul said here, that we're going to be there until Pentecost. We're going to be there. We understand there's some adversaries. We understand there's going to be some trials and some tribulation and some troubles and some persecution. There's going to be uh, some cold days and some hot days. And, and there's going to be some uh, days when we're not as determined as other days. And there's going to be times in our life that we seemingly... We cannot go on, but what are we going to do in those days at that time? And Paul said, hey, I'm going to stay until Pentecost is here. What are we going to do in those days? I got to thinking about Paul here and how God had opened the door for him and what Paul was doing here. Let me just say this thing. Paul was neither an optimist nor a pessimist. Amen. An optimist is being optimistic. Amen. There are a lot of people sitting in church houses, including this church house, that are very optimistic about a lot of things. Amen? If you talk to them about it, you ask them about it, they're very optimistic. There's only a few in this church that are very pessimistic about things that say, well, I don't know if it can happen or not. That's what a pessimist is. Well, Brother Mike, I just don't know. Well, Brother Mike, do you know what that's going to do for the people? Well, Brother Mike, do you don't know what that's going to cost. Well, Brother Mike, do you know how, what a strain that really puts on the, on the people? They, hey, hey, there's only a few of them that I have to deal with from time to time. Hey, Amen. Most people are optimistic around here. Hey, Amen. But can I tell you, optimism will not bring revival. Being optimistic means uh, there's an anticipation, there's an expectation of something. There's a great hope there. We're leaning toward the brighter side of things. But that will not bring revival in the land. Paul was neither optimistic nor pessimistic in this. Paul was realistic in this. Paul got in where it was real. Paul said, hey, I understand there are some adversaries. I understand there's going to be trouble. I understand persecution will come my way. I understand I'm going to be tired. I understand I'm going to be wore out. But Paul said there is an effectual door that's open here, a door for an effective work to be open here. Paul's number one goal was to see souls saved for the cause of Christ. And he said, I'm going to stay here until God births something out of that. Can I say to you today, we can be as optimistic as we want to about putting up a tent and getting it all done, but that will not get it done. You'd better get real. I'd better get real. You'd better get real with yourself. You'd better get real with God. You'd better get real with the church. You'd better determine in your mind whether you're going to be able to handle it or not. Can you come night after night? Can the choir sing night after night? Can the pianist play night after night? Can the choir leader lead like night after night? Hey, can the moderator moderate? night after night can you be here to to work the altar night after night hey can you be here to fix food and those kind of things night after night you'd better get real real quick because it's going to get real with you 
And I looked around here last Sunday, and about 95% of the people said, Hey, Brother Mike, I want to see the tent go up. I want to see revival. God's just going to find out how real we are. God's going to find out how dedicated we are. Because there's a lot of sacrifice to having revival. There's a lot of real stuff that has to happen to have revival. I'm very optimistic about it, but I want to tell you something about me as your pastor. I'm very nervous about it. I'll tell you what I get afraid of, and I'm just going to be boldly honest with you. I'm going to be a realist today. I'll tell you what I'm afraid of. The brother Mike will get this thing started, and not everybody's going to work it all the way out, and I'm going to want to finish it to the end, and I will kill myself trying to, trying to get to the end of it. Because I'm going to be there until the end. And I work myself to death. And then I want to complain about those that are not there that said they're going to be there. God help me not to complain. God help me just to move forward and do what I'm going to do, whatever God calls me to do at that time. Listen, Paul was a realist. He wasn't just being optimistic here and said, hey, I'm just going to stay optimistic. I believe God's going to use No, Paul said, hey, I'm going to stay here until God births something out of it. I'm going to stay here until God rises up something out of it. I'm going to be here for the long haul. Let me just share a few things with you about Pentecost. Turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Turn here with me to Acts chapter 2. I want to show you something here if I can today. And I know I'm going to probably run out of time here in a few minutes. I always do. But what I don't preach to you today, I'll preach to you next Sunday. Because we're not going to have service ran here tonight. We're going to have a business meeting, take care of some business. Amen. And then we'll come here next Sunday and preach the rest of it if we need to. That won't be a problem. Listen, we're not going to have time to complain. God's work must be important to us. Paul said, I've got a goal here. I'm going to win the lost. And listen to what Paul did. I, I, like, I like this right here. Paul seized the opportunity to do a work to be a steward for God. He seized that opportunity. And I, and I want to say to you that if God allows something to go on out here, you and I are going to have to seize the opportunity and forget about the obstacles. Because there will be some obstacles that come our way. I just said a while ago, we're going to meet here at 530 in the afternoons on Tuesday, and we're going to pray out there, rain, snow, or shine. Amen. And the chance that it's going to rain out there one Tuesday afternoon or snow out there one Tuesday afternoon is a 100% chance. Amen. God's going to make sure of it. Why? He wants to see if we're real or not. We can be very optimistic and say, man, boy, that's a good idea, Brother Mike. I'm glad you came up with it. Y'all go at it and y'all have a good time. I've told y'all this a couple of times, beating the man down, to, down at the Bojangles there and he and I told him, he got to talking about the church and he got to talking about what his church couldn't do, what they hadn't done and this, that, and the other and, and talking, about, talking about our church. And I said, well, God's been good to us. We're growing this, that, and the other. And he said, well, how do we do that and, and get that done? And I said, well, I don't know how you do it, but I can, take, I can tell you what's, what's working for us. He Go back and tell them that. <laughs> Y'all will get that in a minute. Good idea, brother Mike. Go at it. Y'all get it done. We'll come in. Look, we'll come in and get the gravy when everything's going fine. We'll sit the pew. And we're going to shout it out with you. I don't just want you to shout it out with me. I want you to be there in the labor department. I want you to be there in the finance department. <laughs> I can tell that we're a little bit weak, amen. I should be there for the duration to get it done. But in order to do that, you must be a realist. You can't just be optimistic about it. Paul was a realist. He wasn't pessimist about it. He wasn't optimistic about it. Paul was real about it. And if we're ever going to see a Pentecost, now, I don't have the time today, but I'll take the time during the service sometime maybe next week to explain to you what a real Pentecost is. Pentecost, if you'll go back here to the book of Acts, you'll find out that something that was in the mind of God, that was in the mind of God, nothing has ever surprised God. God's never had to think whether this is going to uh, happen or not. Nothing, nothing, nothing has just ever occurred to God. Hey, God has always been, as it will always be. God always knew uh, everything in the church that was in the mind of God some thousands of years before the day of Pentecost, all of a sudden, on the day of Pentecost, was birthed into life. And before that birthing, there was some pain. 
Before that birthing, there was a lot of travail. Matter of fact, the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 8, the Bible says this, and as, as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth a child. Amen? As soon as Zion travailed. In, 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 in Pentecost, there has to be some travail. There has to be some sacrifice. Matter of fact, I, I thought about it this way. There will be no Pentecost without plenty cost. Right. Right. Amen? There will be no Pentecost without plenty cost. Amen? Pentecost is going to cost us something. Pentecost was going to cost Paul something. He said, there's adversaries here. There's a lot going on against me, but I'm staying here until I see something birth. I'm staying here until God gets finished, until we rise up, or I see God rise up in something. Let me read Acts chapter 2 and the first eight verses here. And I'm going to share several characteristics with you here uh, when we look at Pentecost that's going to have to take place in order for us to see revival. In order for God to raise up a Pentecost, in order for God to, to save souls and see things done, as in the day of Pentecost, you and I are going to have to go through some things. He says here in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Let me stop right there. If I were to say, I'm done, I'm gone, see y'all. If you're in one accord with everybody in the building, everybody in your life, everybody in the Christian world, follow me out the door. A bunch of you will still be sitting in the pew when I'm gone. Hello, amen, Brother Mike. That's good preaching right there. You're exactly right, and we need to get it right with God. I, 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 boy, I hate to have to go, yeah. Do you hear what he said? That takes work on our part. Because I promise you, I don't know of a church anywhere where everybody is in accord with everybody else. But he said... They were all in one accord in one place. He right. said, Brother Mikey, it wasn't that many people, though. <laughs> I know there was 120 in the upper room praying, Brother Chris. That's a pretty good number. And if I had one thought for a second, I'd get 120 people in one accord, I, I'd, I'd do a dance. I'd jump up and down, probably cut flips down the aisle if I thought I'd get 120 people in one accord. Everybody think like... Paige, look up here at me. It's my daughter-in-law right here. That means, and this will kill her, that means she would have to think just like me. One accord. Huh? That, did y'all preach, girl? <laughs> yeah, somebody record that. Amen. That's exactly what that means. That we'd have to get in one accord with God, get in one accord with the Word of God, get in one accord with the man of God, get in one accord with each other. We would have to come together in one accord and everybody believe the same thing alike and be in it for the same cause so that we could defeat the adversaries that come our way. A lot of times a Christian feels like they're fighting that battle alone. There's pastors all over this country standing behind pulpits today. They feel like they're fighting that battle alone. I'm glad I don't feel that way. I know I've got some people on my back. I know I've got some people that's got my back. I know I've got some people in one accord. I know I've got some people that think the same way. I know I've got some people that love the Word of God and they want to see revival. I know that I've got that. But do I know that I got everybody? <laughs> I can't lie to you. I don't. That don't mean I don't love you. That don't mean I ain't going to go after you. That don't, that don't mean I ain't going to try. How you know it? How you know I don't agree? <laughs> don't ask me that, please. <laughs> One's track record means a lot to me. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, we're going to get good in a little bit. They were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were. 
sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire that set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, said one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? It goes on here to explain the 17 different languages and nations that were there that day that heard in their own language. It gets down to verse 14, and Peter picks up the mantle here, so to speak, and starts to, uh, starts to preach and get the work done for the glory of God here at Pentecost. A real Pentecost does not come cheap. It comes with plenty of cost. Every time I read this, my heart gets stirred, my, my mind gets stirred. I, I get to thinking about uh, the revival. I get to thinking about Pentecost. I, I got to think, listen, I, 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 I've said this before, I, I know, but you think about 3,000 souls getting saved there, uh, there at one time, at one meeting, in one day, and we've been in meetings where there's several hundred got saved, and we've been in meetings where there's 10, 15 to 20. I uh, get saved and we get excited over one getting saved and we should. But think about the very thought that all of a sudden one day the glory of God falls and the church is birthed and, and something comes alive in the church and, and 3,000 souls get saved at one time and, and we got to deal with all of them in their own language and in their own, in their own way. Listen, what a, what a time that must have been at that time. But that didn't come without a cost. That did not come cheap. Sad to say, in most of our churches and our pulpits today, we're hearing secondhand stuff over and over and over and over again, and it's not stirring anybody to do anything. Our churches go in today, the they go in one way and go out the same. Amen? They go in, they sit on the pew, they, they listen for 30 minutes, you go past that, they turn you off anyway, they already turned off anyway as far as I'm I'm concerned. They hit the door and they go out. They live the same way, act the same way, do the exact same things, and they never change. They never do anything different in their life. That's not revival. That's not a real Pentecost. Pentecost comes with plenty of cost. I want to give you, if I can, and I'll start right here, and I know I won't finish. I'll finish it next week, but I want to give you several things here with, that comes with the price of Pentecost. When Paul says, I'm going to stay until Pentecost, I'm going to stay until you birth something God I'm going to say until you raise something up out of this I'm going to say until souls are saved and and ministers are started and and preachers are called and and missionaries are called and and people surrender to the gospel and people surrender a uh, full time to the ministry and and church people get right with God and and they take on a work in the church house and and the church decides it's going to get together and witness and grow and and do all of these things. I'm going to stay until all of these things take place. We've had revival after revival around here. Some of you here today because of a revival meeting at this church. But a lot of them that came to revival around here over the years and said they got saved, I hadn't seen them since revival. And they're not in church anywhere. They're not doing anything at all for God. Amen. They're not doing nothing. We're not careful. We'll put our eyes on them. But we have to look at the work that God is doing here at Pentecost. Let me give you several things that was going on. Number one, they were praying. Pentecost will never come without prayer. Revival will never show up without prayer. Brother Cliff said this morning, it's not about a tent. Brother D.R. can't bring revival. Revival starts in the heart of the church. Uh, the people in the church. Listen, Pente at Pentecost, they were praying at this particular time. They've been praying for 10 days straight. Day and night, they've been praying at this time. They'd been praying a long time before that, but at this particular time, it was 10 days, night and day. They're in the upper room praying. Everybody's a praying. Listen, they broke loose in a prayer meeting. It was intercessory prayer. It was a prayer that birthed something into them that they cried out to God. It wasn't a two-second prayer on the altar. It wasn't a 30-second prayer on the altar. It wasn't, Lord, I lay my, Lord, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray my soul to, Lord, soul to keep. It wasn't those little uh, prayers that we say. It wasn't the Lord's prayer uh, that, that, that's quoted by millions all over the world from time to time. 
that most of the time don't mean anything because I can tell you this, most churches take the Lord's Prayer out of context anyway. The Lord's Prayer has meaning to it over there in Matthew chapter 6. It has a lot of meaning to it. Matter of fact, I, I jotted down a few notes, a few notes about that the other week. Let me see what I see if I got my got my paper here. Let me let me let me let me just let me tell you something real quick about the Lord's Prayer. Sixty-six familiar words, most the most sixty-six familiar words you ever heard in the house of God most of the time. But let me tell you something about that prayer over there in Matthew chapter six. Amen. It's that when you talk about that prayer, number one, that prayer calls for a relationship with God. When we pray that prayer, amen, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Hey, listen, we pray all that. You know what it becomes in church? It becomes routine in the church. Well, Brother Mike, we say it every time we go out, but yeah, it don't mean anything because that prayer recalls for a relationship with the Father himself. Our Father, when you get real, and we get real, and we recognize who God is. Listen to you. Listen to me. Most of us would not treat our Father the way we treat God. Amen. Why? We respect Him too much. We love Him too much. If you think for one minute that all three of my kids that are in here working here agree with me all the time, you're crazy. I know they don't. But I can tell you what they do. They respect me as their father. And they honor me as their father. And they treat me the way they treat me because I'm their father. It don't always mean that they agree with me in everything. But they still respect me and honor me because I'm their father. And on top of that, I'm their pastor. I can't imagine what it is being a kid and your dad a pastor. I mean, you have to respect him as a pastor. When he says, shut up and go do this. The shut up part was a dad. The, pa the other part was a pastor. You know, pastors ain't supposed to say shut up. So as a dad, I said shut up. And then as a pastor, I said go do it. Amen. I mean, we said the same thing as a dad. That's before I became a pastor. Amen. I but we got to understand something about prayer. Amen. I I'm telling you, we got to have intercessory prayer with God. We got to have, have prayer where seemingly that's birthing. We got to have prayer that we have to travail over. I'm talking about something where we weep with God, cry out to God. I mean, we lay on the altars for hours or whatever time it takes that we cry out to God. Not some 30 second prayer to get up that don't mean anything. I'm talking about a prayer where you and I have a relationship with the Father Himself. Our Father. Not only does that prayer have a relationship with the Father, it calls for reverence toward God. The average person in the average church today, they have a problem with reverencing God. Can I tell you this? The world has a problem with reverence today. They're not, they, they, look, they don't want anybody in authority over them. They're not going to reverence anybody. You know, what, you know what people got the mindset today in the world has done this? That if we rev, reverence them, that means they're higher than us. <laughs> and... Politically, it's not right to think that anything is higher than you. I mean, you are who God made you, and you are special, and all that's true. And, and God made you just, there's nothing out there higher than you. God made, that's a lie from the devil, from the pits of hell. Listen, God is to be reverenced in our prayer. Yes. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed, hallowed, holy, holy, Holy be their name. See, it, when we we talking about prayer here, we get real with prayer here at, at Pentecost. It, listen, prayer has to cost us something. We feel like this day and time, we can run to the altar, pray, we pray for 30 seconds, we get up and go on. What do we do? Well, we told God about our problem. God, will you fix them? And God, you know about our problem. Will you just go ahead and fix that? And you know what God said most time? Hey, hey, come back here and park it right here. And Brother Mike, he said, we're we going to fix it. What are you going to do? I'm going to tell you what I want you to do, and you go do it, and this is going to fix it. Well, no, God, I want you to fix it. Shut up and listen to me. I'm going to tell you <laughs> what I want you to do, and we're going to fix it. See, see, that's the part we don't want to do. We don't want to have to do anything. We just want God to fix it. We want 30 seconds of, time of our time telling God what we want. We don't want God telling us anything that we got to do. And it, it don't work that way. Intercessory prayer, when we get real with God and we start to fail in prayer, we start begging God, God, 
What would you have me to do? Open my eyes. Let me clean my life up. Let me repent. Let me get rid of some things. Let me get it settled in my life. Bless me. Give me the strength to do it, God. Please, I beg you, show me my wrongdoings. Oh, I ain't about to do that. I'm afraid God will. Amen. And I don't want to have to put that down. Then we don't want revival. There's no Pentecost without Pentecost. Jeremiah says, God says over there in 33, 3, call unto me and I'll answer you. And show you great and mighty things that you know. Listen, we don't even know what God has in store for us. We can't even fathom what God has in store for us. We can't even fathom what God wants to do out here under that tent. You and I, we, li listen, we can't, can't matter of fact, my, Michael and I were out there the other day, and we kind of knew where we wanted the tent, but we can't get the tent where we wanted because of the grave of the land and the thing's going to happen and meet all the setbacks, Brother Mike. We didn't have to move the tent. We didn't gone down to the zoning department. We've been down to the zoning department. We've been to the uh, building department. We've gone in and got all the paperwork and everything, try to, try to get everything done. It's like God said, I'm like, God, this is where I wanted all along. God, God's saying that that ain't where it's going to be. But y'all know y'all's pastor well enough. No, I, I, want, I want it. <laughs> God, it don't even look right down there. That's where it's going to be. You want revival or not? Amen? You want to get it done or not? You going to listen to me or you want, you want to run the show? I found that real quick. God, I don't want to run that show. I don't want to be in charge. I don't want to be in charge. I, look, listen, if I could just come night after night, run in there and sit on the pew and shout it out, night after night, run that, run that, jump in my car and go to the house, woo! I'd shout the victory with the rest of you. Can't be that way. It's going to take travailing prayer, intercessory prayer. God desires to birth something out of that. Can I tell you something else? <laughs> listen to this right here. Here's, here's what it's going to take to, to see Pentecost. It's going to take preaching. It's going to take preaching. There ain't going to be no Pentecost without preaching. Why? Because that's what bought, that's what bought Pentecost right here. Amen. Good preaching. Now, if all that crowd out there on Facebook that don't like me being loud and don't like me being long, they have not read their Bible. Acts chapter 2, verse 14. Turn back over there real quick. Acts chapter 2, verse 14. Look, I know it's time to quit. I, I, I can tell time. Acts chapter 2, verse 14. I don't have a problem telling time. I just don't pay no attention to it. Amen. Acts chapter 2, verse 14. See this right here. But Peter, I love this. Standing up with 11. Did what? He got loud. I mean, redneck terminology. You can read that any way you want to. He got loud. Amen. And Peter went about to preaching for a long time there, Brother Mike. I mean, there had to be some preaching to take place. And Peter had to get loud with the people. And Peter, uh, Peter had to get, look, he had to get serious uh, with the people at the time. He had to proclaim the gospel. He had, listen, the Bible talks about how that means to strongly urge. It means to deliver. It means to proclaim. And I've said this before, too. Here's, here's how Peter got the people convicted to do what they did in revival place. Pentecost to come. He started meddling. He started meddling. Some of you going, wait a minute, what does he know? You'd be surprised. You get mad at me if I say it, but you post it on Facebook everywhere. You put it there for the whole world to see. And here's what really gets me. When the preacher brings it up from the pulpit, he got a right to do that. He uh -huh. bashed me that way. No preacher ought not ever, ever do that. And you don't show it to the whole world. But you do realize preaching is meddling, right? It means getting down to where you're living at. It means getting serious with you and your sin. Why? Because the Bible said when Peter got done preaching, guess what? They repented. They repented of what? Of the stuff he was meddling in. It was sin. And they began to come and repent. 3,000 souls saved. There had to be preaching. People say, all the time, well, I don't like that kind of preaching. You don't like much of nothing else either. <laughs> Amen. 
Well, I don't like it when you, you don't have to be loud like that. Read your Bible. You don't have to be so long. You know, church is, you go in at, at 11, you get out at 12. That's your church. That's not God's church. We get out when God gets done with us. What time are we going to finish up out here at night? I don't know. It could be 9 o'clock if we start at 7. It could be 12 o'clock if God still got the man of God preaching and souls are still being saved and we're still dealing with people and they're still coming to an altar. It might be midnight. I don't know what time we're going to leave. There ain't no church time that I, there's no church sign that I've ever seen yet that says that we start at 11, we get out at 12. Every sign that I see has a start time. Now, after this, they may change that. Start time, 11. Finish time, 11.45. We've got to meet the rest of the crowd before they get to Bojangles. But if we're going to see Pentecost, there's got to be preaching. There's got to be praying. I love this part, and I'll close. It's 12.03. I know what time it is. I got big letters on my phone. <laughs> Matter of fact, that reminds me, 12.03. I'm thinking about Psalm 103. There was praising. The Bible says, Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Praising God. And having faith with all the people and the Lord. Added to the church daily, such as should be saved. This is Mikeology right here. I'm going to step out behind the pulpit. This is Mikeology. You know why the church is not being added to this day and time? I ain't found nobody yet. They won't, won't be running to the graveyard to sign up. Because they're dead. That's why they ain't running to them. That's why they're not signing up. They're dead. Ain't nothing going on. Ain't about praising God. Ain't about worshiping God. There is total deadness. There's total silence. Matter of fact, you, you can't even hardly hear the preacher in the morning. They're going, why did he say? You won't run out of here and say that about me. Now, that's some of you might sleep through it and not get it. But it ain't going to be because I ain't loud enough. Amen. If we're going to see some Pentecost, we're going to see God do something great. There's going to have to be some praising going on. I told this when I was in Greenville the other week, and Tapley will remember there's some mom them. I probably told it here and when I was down in South Carolina preaching several years ago. And it wasn't long after my heart surgery, I know, and because that's what word tapped to death. I had all those catheterizations and, and uh, had way too many of them, a lot of stents put in. And uh, I got the preaching down there, and the glory of God got in me. Amen. And God just got all over me there. And I read Psalm 103. Y'all know what it says? Bless his holy name. Thou art God. Thou art holy. Bless his holy name. And I stood up there that night. And I read that. And something crawled all over me. About 20 minutes later, I was still running back and forth across the altar up there. Just shouting, bless his holy name. That's all I preached for 20 minutes. Thou art holy. Bless his holy name. And I started shouting and carrying on and getting, and listen, tapped on, sit up there and got word. Evidently, I done got all red in the face. I looked like I couldn't breathe. Jane was in the nursery with the babies. Tapped takes off to the nurse to go get her mama. Said, go get dad off the stage. He going to kill himself. <laughs> I was just in the glory. Praising God. Amen. Okay, do, you, do, you, do you believe that the average Christian has just, just never been in the glory before? Amen. Amen. And here's what they say. Listen to me. Not everybody acts the same way all the time. And I fully understand. I'm glad they don't. Amen. I couldn't stand all y'all if y'all was just like me. I couldn't put up with you. To be too loud, too long, too noisy. Amen. Well, but Mike, I just don't do that that way. I just don't worship that way. That's fine. We could at least see some humility. We could at least see some tears flowing down his face. We can at least know that somehow or another that, that God's got a hold of you, amen? But I, I'm, if I read my Bible right, and, and I read every place in the Word of God where God got a hold of somebody, they acted out on a couple of different ways. They either began to weep, weep, 
and get them humility weak or they got excited and they ran the aisle mm-hmm. and yeah. they jumped the pews and they jumped over things and they they had themselves a spelled how or <laughs> amen you know what the problem is today people just really don't they don't even know how to worship god anymore they, and listen you've heard me say before if you look up here at me this this is this ain't my theology on it. This is Bible theology. I appreciate worship, and I appreciate raising my hand, being do all those things. But it ain't all about that all the time. Sometimes God deals with us in that still, small voice, and we'll hit an altar. We'll be worshiping God, weeping and crying, emotionally like the week where we can't even stop. Amen? But there must be some praising. Why? Because I found the characteristic here in the book of Acts that they were praising God. Listen, they sang that song this morning. What was, that, what was the name of that first song y'all sang? Huh? That's my God. That's my God. I can get a little carried away about that. That stirs me up. Amen? That stirs me up where I, where I just want to just lift my hand and say, yeah, that's, that's my God. Amen? I, why? Because I love him. He's my God. He's my Father. I reverence him. Amen? That's my God. Listen, if that don't stir you up, there's something wrong in there somewhere. Amen? Somehow or another, it ought to just... Just stir us up. Like I said, I, I've seen those that didn't run and shout, but I've seen them sit on a pew and just, just weep in humility and say, oh, that's my God. Amen. That's my God. Amen. That's my God. And I love him. Hey, what are we going to do out in the world when people start persecuting Jesus and, and calling him all kind of names and, and, and running him down? And I'm going to have to look at him and say, hey, that's still my God. <laughs> You're crazy, I am, but that's still my God. Amen. Amen. I still love him. I don't care what you think about him. Amen. People look at James sometimes. Your husband's crazy. He said, that's my husband. I still love him. I don't like the way he preaches. That's your problem. That's still my husband. I still love him. Amen. That's my God. I still love him. And we're going to praise him either way, regardless regardless of what the world thinks and how they want you to act. Hey, not not only that, let 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 me close. I think they were mindful. Of Psalm 100, and I thought about this many, many times. If you go over there, Psalm 100, and you read Psalm 100, and it talks about how they 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 enter the court courts there, praising God and just just worshiping God right from the get go. You know, in the average church today, you have to come into the church house, and, and you have to have Sunday school, and then you got to have two or three songs, and then the preacher's got to preach for about 30, 40 minutes, and then you finally get a smile. And listen, it takes all of this work. What would it be like? What would it be like if we just came through the door worshiping God? What would it be like if we just, I mean, from the get go, worship God? What would it be like if we just, look, if we get, get out of our vehicles outside in the parking lot, dump everything that's in our life, dump it off of us there in the parking lot, or put it in the back of the truck? I don't care, blow out going down the road. Amen? Dump everything off of our life out in the parking lot and come through the door with that glow about us and that smile about us and that joy about us and say i i just came to worship him Amen. i i just came to worship the lord today preach i listen ain't you know ain't nobody I, here's what happens we we come in brother bobby and, and and all of a sudden you know somebody says something to us we don't like amen <laughs> there's a demon in every crowd amen somebody says something to us we don't like and we're ruined for the rest of the day what would it be if you came into the church house and you couldn't get your feelings hurt? Think about that. I don't care what Tyler said, it couldn't hurt it, he couldn't hurt my feelings. Tell me the preacher, you know that message you had last week? Yeah, dude, it stunk. You know what I tell him? Misery loves company. I appreciate you being here today. You stink too, and I appreciate you being in the house of the Lord today. Thank God. Now, I'd be okay. <laughs> I ain't sure about here. <laughs> Just before the preaching started, when my back was turned toward the choir, him and Mary had to get up and walk out. I'm thinking, yeah, he stinks. He proved it. He don't tell me that. Well, if we dumped it on the outside, we wouldn't have to worry about that. Amen? That's tough, isn't it? But if we're going to have revival, there's going to have to be some praise going to it. Let's all stand up feet today. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed, just a minute. Blake, come get on the piano for me. Listen, I, I know 
I've tried to preach today. I've carried on a little bit today. I, I've told some very serious things today. I've been very real with you today. Uh, life is realistic when it comes to serving God with me. How bad you want revival? How much praying you going to do? How much preaching you going to endure? How much you going to have? Paige, you ought to go to the altar before you run out on me, just so you know. How much praise are we going to have? She's going to kill me this afternoon. It's okay. Let me just ask you this. Is your heart in a condition where you can praise Him? Where you can enjoy the things of God? I mean, where, listen, man, when the preaching starts, you're going to praise Him. Singing starts, you're going to praise Him. You're just going to praise Him because He's your God. Why? Because I want to see a revival. I want to see God birth a Pentecost out of this place. Brother Mike, you want to see 3,000 souls get saved? No, I want to see 5,000 souls get saved. I want to see God raise up a mighty army out of this thing. I want to see God do something bigger than we are or bigger than we ever thought God could be. Greater than our wildest dreams could ever imagine I want God to raise up something and birth something that big out of New Life Baptist Church and the tent revival. Are you ready? Are you ready now? Listen, we talked about it last week, and there's a lot of people raising their hands. Are we ready? We willing to pray to get it done? Pray for the preacher and do the preaching, soak it in, get things right with God. Pray and worship His holy name regardless of what goes on around us. Are we willing? If we're not careful. It'll be one of those situations where we'll be optimistic and things will get started. And after about the second or third day, we'll go, I'm cutting out of here. I'm tired. It's going to be the same old preaching. It's going to be the same old singing. We forget about those souls that come get under the tent that are lost that need Jesus. And we'll not see them saved. How about you? Are you at that point? There will be no Pentecost without plenty call. Bible will not come with sacrifice of the people. God's not going to send a revival to an unconcerned people. God's not going to send a revival to a people that are not willing to carry the load and run the race. Do you feel in your heart today that, man, I'm ready, Brother Mike. I want to get it done. I want to see God move. I want to praise Him. I want to worship Him. I want to be that prayer warrior. I want to see God save souls. We've got to be real. Souls are dying going to hell. They're even passing laws where you can kill babies up to the moment of their birth. Killing babies, murderers. We need revival. This country will be under new laws in the years to come. We'll be facing the Sharia laws in this country more than ever. We won't even be able to walk under our government laws. What are we going to do about it? You know what they say it's going to take to fix it? It's going to take a revival. It's going to take a Pentecost. It's going to take God to birth something in order to change America. It's the only thing that'll change it. Are we willing? be no Pentecost without plenty call. I love you today. You can look right up here. Appreciate you being in the house of the Lord this morning. We'll not have a service tonight, but those of you that want to be a part of our business meeting, especially our church folks,
today at 4 o'clock. We don't normally have a service after a business meeting. I scheduled a little early today, not because I don't think we're going to be here a long, long time, but just in case we wouldn't be so late getting home. Amen. It won't be long if you listen to me and I got everything laid out right here and everything printed out. You don't ask me a question. It won't be too long, but if you do, we'll stay here till we're done. Amen. But Mike, you think you got it all together? I know I don't have it all together. That's, how, that's why we have business meetings. Amen. But I appreciate you. Love you in the Lord. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord this morning. Now, every head bowed, every eye closed real quick. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody looks around. Who's ready to